In today's video, I'm going to go over some of the terminology I often use when I'm categorizing different Linux distributions. So I'm going to discuss some terms I've used a lot in the past couple of years, but I've never really defined them. Sometimes you guys ask me exactly what I mean when I use some of these terms. So we have different types of Linux distributions, different categories. And the very first one I want to talk about is what I call core distributions. So when I talk about core distros, I'm talking about the longtime stalwarts out there in the Linux world. I'm talking about the giants. I'm talking about Slackware, Debian, Arch, Gentoo, SUSE, Red Hat, Ubuntu. For the most part, these Linux distributions have been around for a long time. They started, most of them started as independent projects. Some of them were forks of a parent distro, but they've been around so many years that they've really differentiated themselves from their parent distribution. Things like SUSE is not, not anywhere like Red Hat, which is what it was originally forked from. Ubuntu has really differentiated itself from Debian. Core distros are the ones that I typically tell you guys to try out first. These are the distros I typically recommend. Why? Well, typically the core distros, they've been around for years, right? They have very large communities around them. They usually have very large repositories of software. And these distributions are much more likely to still be around five, ten years down the road than some of the other categories of Linux distributions that I'm about to talk about. The second category of Linux distributions I want to talk about is the, quote, user-friendly distros. Now, these distros take one of the core distros and they try to improve upon it with the goal of making it more user-friendly. Distros such as Linux Mint, Manjaro, MX, and many, many others can be considered user-friendly distros. They're taking the parent distro, whether it be Debian, Ubuntu, Arch, and they're trying to improve upon it because they, for some reason, think the parent distro is not, quote, user-friendly, and they are going to transform it in such a way to make it more user-friendly, more palatable to the masses. So the user-friendly distros, what they do is they take that core distro that they're basing off of, and they add a bunch of extra cruft on top of it. They add all these unnecessary packages and libraries and, you know, just all this unnecessary bloat to their distro in this misguided effort. But these user-friendly distributions, they really miss the mark because things are only, quote, easier, you know, if you take a Linux distribution and you never modify it or change it in any way. And if you're that kind of user, yeah, maybe these user-friendly distributions are, in fact, user-friendly but if you plan on modifying or changing the system in any way, starting with one of the user-friendly distributions is actually going to be quite unuser friendly These kinds of distros are going to make your life more difficult once you get under the hood and want to tinker around a little bit. They add a ton of useless programs that you're not going to use. If you want to go to the trouble of uninstalling them, now you have to spend all this time getting ri rid of all the bloated software that came prepackaged with this distro. The user-friendly distributions also dumb down the user interface to, quote, avoid confusing the new user. But often all this does is it locks you into this user interface. It locks you into this specific workflow that you really can't change. In a lot of ways, these user-friendly Linux distributions, they try to follow the Apple model, right? They try to follow this walled garden model of Mac OS. The third category of Linux distributions I want to talk about is what I call garage distros. If you've been following the channel for a while, I often review a small distribution and refer to it as a garage distro. You can envision it, right? Three teenagers hanging out in their garage, hovering around a single computer, you know, working on their respin of Debian or Arch. More often than not, these garage distros are maintained by one person. These garage distros suffer from a serious lack of manpower, and because of that, oftentimes they do not vary that much from their parent distro. Oftentimes, the only difference between the garage distro and whatever distro they're basing off of is a change in wallpaper and maybe a different desktop environment. Such trivial differences may or may not make it worth your time to fool with the garage distro. Add to that that the garage distro 
definitely will not survive the bus factor. For those of you not familiar with what that term means, the bus factor, it means that what happens when you get hit by a bus, right? If these distros only have one maintainer, if the lead dev gets hit by a bus, that distro dies. The fourth category of Linux distribution I want to discuss is the meme distro. What is a meme distro? Well, we should talk about what is a meme. Meme are these funny sayings or images that get spread rapidly around the internet. And the meme distro, in a similar vein, is often seen, at least initially, as a joke. It is a joke distro or a troll distro. Some obvious examples would include Satanic Linux, Suicide Linux, and of course the ever popular Hannah Montana Linux. These distros seem like the only reason they were created was just for the giggles, but sometimes the joke catches on. People start using this new meme distro, by the way. Yes, Arch is easily the most popular meme Linux distribution out there. And it's pretty obvious that Arch is a meme distro. I mean, nobody uses Arch because it's the right Linux distribution for them. You're using Arch for the cool factor. It's all about the style points. It's all about looking cool when you're posting over on 4chan or r slash Unix porn. And Gentoo can also be considered a meme distro. Really, so many Arch users and so many Gentoo users were memed into using those distros. That's how so many of them got into the distro to begin with. In fact, in my opinion, I think Arch and Gentoo probably will forever be meme distros. But new ones crop up from time to time. I would consider Void Linux to be a meme distro. And the fifth and final category of Linux distributions I'm going to describe today is what I often call protest distros. You guys have heard me call certain distros protest distros on my videos in the past. Some of you have been confused by exactly what I mean when I say protest distro. What is the definition of protest distro? Well, it is a distribution that's based off another distribution, and it's forked from that other distribution in anger, in protest. It's basically creating a fork of a distribution because you're protesting a decision that the parent distribution made. The most famous example of a protest distro is Linux Mint. When Linux Mint started many years ago, all Linux Mint was was a respin of Ubuntu with the multimedia codex pre-installed for you because Ubuntu didn't ship with those multimedia codex for legal reasons. But very shortly after Linux Mint started, Ubuntu started making some decisions that angered a lot of the Ubuntu community, and most of those folks flocked over to Linux Mint, really in protest. When Ubuntu was having problems, you know, switching desktop environments from GNOME to Unity and now back to GNOME 3, or, you know, some of the controversies surrounding some of the stuff with telemetry, with the Amazon Lens in Unity, with Snaps, most of them ran to Linux Mint, and many of them did that not because Linux Mint was the best alternative out there, although it's a fine Linux distribution. Many of them saw that as the best way to protest Ubuntu. I'm moving to Mint, and, and you know what? I'm going to tell every other Ubuntu user out there to move to Mint. Why? It's because Mint is not Ubuntu. Protest distros have really made a comeback in recent years because of System D. When Arch moved to System D, and then later when Debian moved to System D, we saw protest distros spring up around those Linux distributions. When Arch switched to System D, some folks forked Arch and created Artix in protest. When Debian switched to System D, some folks forked Debian. They created DevOne in protest. When you go to the websites for Artix and DevOne, rather than finding a bunch of reasons why you should run Artix and DevOne, really all you find on their websites is all the reasons why System D is bad and, by association, why Arch and Debian are bad, because they use System D. So those are five categories of Linux distributions that I often use, and I haven't done a good job of defining them. So we have core distro, user-friendly distro, garage distro, meme distro, and protest distro. Before I go, I need to thank a few special people. All these names you're seeing on the screen, these guys help support my work over on Patreon. Without these guys, this episode wouldn't be possible. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider doing so. You'll find me over at Patreon. Just look for DistroTube over on Patreon. Alright guys, peace.